All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Civic Camp Citizens Ward 3 Counselor Forum. Uh, thank you very much for attending tonight and showing an interest in the issues that shape our city, as well as for those of you who are tuning in online via the World Wide Web. Uh, my name is Joey Oberhoffner. I'm a writer for CalgaryPolitics.com, and I will be your moderator tonight. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Civic Camp, Civic Camp is a nonpartisan public advocacy group enabling citizens to engage in creating a city that works for us all. Any Calgarian is welcome to become a Civic Camper by visiting civiccamp.org and learning more about the organization, what values Civic Campers have set out for themselves, and join up with a group that interests them. One of those groups is the Election Initiatives Group. This group decided one of the best ways they could raise public awareness and civic issues during the election was to ensure a forum is held in each ward, something that in 2010 we became the first group in Calgary to do. Uh, we have some thanks to go through this evening uh, before we get started. Uh, big thanks to the Civic Camp volunteers who have donated their time to make tonight's event a reality. Uh, we could not have done it without a few sponsors who generously donated their time and services as well. Uh, first, we'd like to thank our host tonight, Harvest Hills Alliance Church, for the donation of their beautiful venue. Uh, we also want to thank Calgary Sound Rentals and the Calgary Roadrunners for providing equipment for tonight's forum at a significantly reduced rate. Uh, we'd also like to thank our media partners, CBC Calgary, CJSW, Fast Forward Weekly, and Metro Calgary for helping to get the word out about these forums. Thank you to LivestreamCalgary.com, who will be live streaming tonight's proceedings on the internet. Thank you to the Calgary Association of Parents and School Councils and the Alberta Teachers Association for their support with the School Board Trustee Citizens Forums. A big thank you to the Students Association of Mount Royal University, who are our Ward 11 Citizens Forum partner, and the University of Calgary Students Union, who are our Ward 1 and Mayoral Citizens Forum partner, and the Calgary Foundation for helping us pay the few bills that we did acquire. Finally, a big thanks to the candidate and all of you for coming today. Uh, we'll go over quickly the uh, format and ground rules for this evening. Uh, civic campers have named these forums Citizens Forums because the questions for the first two-thirds of tonight's forum have been sourced from Calgarians at large. Civic Camp asked Calgarians what questions they would like to be asked at these forums. Over 65 questions were submitted by dozens of Calgarians. Almost a thousand votes were cast online for which questions Calgarians thought were the most important and most needed asking. The top vote-getting questions are what we will be asking tonight. Here's how the format will work. The candidate will be asked 19 questions uh, over the course of the evening and will be, will be provided two minutes to respond to most of them. Once the candidate has answered the question, I will ask if he would like to expand on his answer. At that time, he can, if he chooses, cash in one of the poker chips he's been given uh, and uh, will be then given one minute to finish his point. To ensure we ask some more ward-specific questions as well, everyone in the audience uh, has been given uh, cards uh, when they entered the hall this evening. Uh, they're also available, uh, I believe, outside the door or uh, just at the back. Yeah, just at the back at the table uh, in the center of the room. Um, if you have a question about something unique to Ward 3, if you could write it on that card and uh, give it to our logistics person, Lisa. Lisa, uh, where are you? Lisa's waving her hand at the back. If you give your card to her, uh, we'll ask four of those questions in the last part of the evening. Uh, working with me tonight are the aforementioned Lisa, uh, who will be handling your ward-specific questions, uh, as well as Jenny, who's going to be running our, uh, uh, running our clock here. Uh, so if you see her hand go up on the camera, don't panic. It's coming down shortly. Uh, and uh, let's see. On that note, I'd like to remind the candidate of the rules of etiquette for this evening. Uh, firstly, uh, respect for the clock. We'd like to get everybody home tonight in time to watch Glee. Uh, we'll have a timer to help you deliver your statement and response in the time provided. Uh, we're going to stay issues focused. This is a forum, not a debate. We want to hear the ideas of the candidate, uh, so the candidate uh, will uh, avoid personal references or criticism directed at fellow candidates. Uh, and we're letting the audience decide. We've asked the supporters to leave their campaign signs outside the room where campaigning is, in fact, encouraged. Applause is okay, but other interruptions from campaigners on the floor will not be allowed. I'd like to introduce our candidate by allowing him two minutes to tell you a little bit about himself. You may recognize him. He is, in fact, the incumbent city council member for Ward 3 and is running for re-election. Please welcome Alderman Jim Stevenson. Jim. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I think that um, most know me because of, in Ward 3 because of the fact that I've been representing the ward for the last six years. Um, before that, I've been very involved in the community associations, 
I actually was president of um, our community association in Coral Springs, and I was president of the Coral Springs Residents Association for a number of years, and I was also the president of the Northeast District for the Conservative Party of Canada, too. So that, that's sort of my background. I, I have to tell you, I've, I've given up on party politics. I kind of like the... Uh, I kind of like being leader of my own party, and uh, and no one can tell me what to say or what not to say, right? So, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing with the city, and and I believe that it's extremely important that the northeast, north central part of the city is well represented. We have a number of issues that we have to work on, and we have been working on them. But my background is business. So uh, I've been in business for a number of years. So as a as a result, I am a, a pro business uh, candidate. I want to put it that way. So that's a little of my background. Okay. I didn't use all my time. Can I use it later? <laughs> I I don't think we have a time bank. Oh, okay, no bank. <laughs> all right. Um, so we're going to jump right into the first round of questionings. Uh, I'm going to ask the question, and then you're going to have two minutes to respond. And again, as a reminder, if you'd like to take a little bit more time with your response, you do have the option with the poker chips as well. So our first question, uh, crowdsourced from uh, citizens of Calgary at large, is... Do you support legalization of secondary suites in all existing neighborhoods, subject only to reasonable safety concerns? Why or why not? Well, first of all, the, I think it's very misleading to talk about legalized suites. What we're talking about really when we're talking about citywide is whether or not we should redesignate or reclassify, change the, um, uh, the land use. And that's the thing that I have a problem with. We have, of course, um, across the city, made a lot of changes uh, just in the last two years. We've changed it so that all new areas are going to have um, land use that permits legal, uh, illegal suites. Right? First, Ill illegal suites are not permitted anywhere in the city, right? Um, but then we also changed, I think 110,000 properties were uh, changed, were redesignated to allow either um, uh, either permitted or discretionary uh, suites in, the, in there, right? So what I'm against is, uh, is a, a blanket redesignation across the city of all our ones without consultation with the people. If, if we want to do some um, changes to, to, uh, to make them uh, permitted, then talk to the community first. If a particular community would like to do that, I think it's great. But I just don't think that we should say to the people in Panorama or Harvest Hills or Sandstone or wherever it might be, we're just changing the classification of your house and the land use designations. I just, I don't agree with that unless we consult with them first. And by the way, the problem is not the, um, the, the classification. The problem is that even though we made all of these um, suites possible to be legalized, we, the uptake was like this: people, because people don't want to spend the forty or fifty thousand dollars it might take to change the um, the suite to bring it into the point of being legal. And I can't blame them for not doing that, but I think we've got some serious problems with our um, with our bylaws the way they sit, and also with the provincial building codes. Those have to be changed. All right, thank you very much. Um, now, second question. Calgary is the only Canadian city of its size with no municipal grants for artists. What role should the city play in investing in its artists? We have an um, <clears throat> arts council, or CADA is what uh, we've, we've set up. That um, CADA, the reason why we set that up is so that someone else can look and see what's needed and the and CADA then comes to us and asks us for money to to designate to certain groups, right? And I think that system is working very well. And we don't then have to get involved in saying yay or nay, but the artists themselves and the the whole uh, group, the Calgary Arts Development Group, uh, they they're the ones that um, make the request to us. So I think it's a good system. Yeah. All right. Uh, 
we're just plowing right through these. As a reminder to the folks at home, uh, Alderman Stevenson does have up to two minutes to answer these questions, but he doesn't have to use the full time. Uh, third question, do you believe that urban sprawl is a problem for the city of Calgary? And if you do, uh, what will you do to address it? And or what have you done in your time on council to address it? Well, one of the things that we've done, of course, is, is greatly increased density <clears throat> in all the new communities uh, we, we annexed all this land for one reason, was to be able to meet the demands of the growth of the city, right? But uh, the, the density is increasing constantly in these new communities. And that's something that we, we're excited about, we're pleased with, right? But the, uh, the, there's a, a myth about the urban sprawl. The myth is that it's extremely expensive for us to develop the communities and that the inner city communities are having to pay for the development of the communities that are on the out, outer edges of the city. And the cost of, um, of us intensifying in the inner city is extremely high too. It's just that we haven't calculated that. I'll give you an example. It's a lot easier for, and a lot uh, more reasonable financially, to put a sewer line into a green field than what it is to put it down, like say, Fourth Avenue and Bridgeland or whatever, right? Um, and yet that's going to be necessary down the road. And what I keep asking is, we need to decide how much it's costing for us to intensify so that we don't have this image out there that all the costs are for the, the greenfield development. I'll give you an exam, uh, example, Joey. Uh, if in Bridgeland we tear down two uh, wartime houses and someone builds a 16plex there on those two lots, which happens all the time, right? Well, there's a lot more toilets in a 16plex than what there is in those two wartime houses, right? And so what, we're, what we have people saying, well, yeah, but we overbuilt back in the 30s, so therefore we can handle it. Well, we can handle that 16plex, but what about when the, the two doors down the street, someone else does the same thing? And then two doors down the street, someone else does it. The cost of us actually building the infrastructure to handle that kind of intensification should be calculated, and to this point, we don't have that calculated. So that's why I'm, un I'm concerned about the the impression that the costs are all with the greenfield. All right, thank you very much. Uh, the, uh, the fourth question from the public at large here in Calgary, uh, how do you think we can create greater mobility uh, choices, uh, for example, biking, walking, and transit in addition to cars uh, in the city and in Ward 3 in particular? We're already doing that, um, and this is uh, one of the things that uh, that I got, uh, I was very strong about when I was first elected, when I first ran, was that <clears throat> we need to make sure we have choices for people uh, that they can live, work, and play all in the same area. And hopefully, they don't have to drive their vehicle to everything that they do. So putting the LRT extension up into Saddletown, that was a big uh, plus, in the, and it's, the ridership is tremendous, a great increase since that. Increasing the 301 that goes right up out in front of this building here was a big thing too. We've added a lot more buses, we're adding constantly more on there. But one of the big things that we've got to do there is establish the route for the North Central LRT line, right? And that route, establishment of that route should likely happen within the next few months because we've got a lot of work going on right now with the study of where it should go. We're not even sure if it's going to go 4th Street or Center Street or Edmonton Trail, where it's going to go. But that has to be decided. So that's uh, allowing people to, uh, in this ward, that will allow the people, once we establish the route and we start building bus lanes in that route, to get to the point where we can handle it once the money comes for the, the LRT. Where that money's going to come from, I'm not sure, because we're talking of billions of dollars in order to do what's going to be called the Green Line. It'll go from up here right through to the South Hospital, right? 
that's hopefully we're going to get the province and the feds to come to the table on uh, helping us do that. But that's those are the big things that we're doing. We're also, of course, doing better uh, road connections like opening 96th Avenue over here helps a lot of people, takes pressure off of Country Hills Boulevard, and we're widening Country Hills Boulevard in order to make sure that we can handle the traffic uh, because there's a huge amount of expansion and uh, building going on all along Country Hills Boulevard, right from here to the East Freeway. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, the fifth question submitted by the people of Calgary online uh, at the Civic Camp website, uh, civiccamp.org, is what would you do to support the Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative and how would your efforts improve that initiative? Well, there's a number of issues. There's a number of uh, directions I can go on that because it's such a huge topic. Uh, <clears throat> one of the areas that I've been working on is to help um, to make sure we get the low-income bus passes and have that set up according to their income, having it free for the people that aren't in a position to pay. Right? Uh, but we have what's called FCSS. I'm not sure a lot of our readers know what, the, what that is, but the FCS is the uh, organization that, uh, like CADA is for the arts, the FCSS is the group that oversees all of the money that's given out to the various uh, non-profit organizations, right? The, Fed, the province has agreed that through the, um, uh, and it's called the, um, I'm trying to think of what FCSS stands for now. I use that term all the time, but it, it's uh, community support services anyway. It's, uh, but the, the province uh, agreement with the province is 80-20. They're supposed to provide 80% to 20% from the city. They have fallen down on that, and uh, for, for a number of years, we were at 25% because they weren't contributing their 80%. Just in the last year, we've gone to 30%. What happens is all of these groups come and present, and I sit on the Community and Protective Services Committee, right? And they come and present each year what their needs are, and it would be very easy for us to say to them, Go and talk to the province, because the province is the one that's falling behind, not us, right? And in fact, we do say that to them. And in fact, I have gone with them. I set up a program where I would volunteer to go with them to lobby the M M M MLAs, and I've done that the last few years, to lobby the province to get on the bandwagon and, and increase their support. But these are so, so many of these are a provincial responsibility, and yet we end up having to take Calgary taxpayers' dollars in order to subsidize them. So. All right. Thank you very much. Um, next question is, with, uh, with higher levels of government initiating a plan to support local sustainability in the food system, can we expect a positive move by the city towards urban agriculture? Well, that's a good question. I really don't know the answer to that because I have not seen a plan for um, urban agriculture. I mean, <clears throat> I know there's, uh, there's groups that are doing community gardens, that kind of thing, and we're facilitating that as much as we can. But I don't know beyond that, um, uh, Joey, what, what uh, would be expected of us in order to do that. I, as I say, nobody's presented to me what it is they want there. You know? Thank you very much. Uh, seventh question is, uh, will you commit to releasing a list of your campaign donors before Election Day, and why or why not? No, I won't, uh, because I'm going to follow the, the law. The law says that uh, we have to pr produce our list of donors at a certain time, and I'll do that. And uh, one of the reasons, by the way, my, my, my situation is an open book anyway, because anybody that wants to can take a look at the last three elections and see who donated to me and it's basically the same group, cast of characters that are behind me now as as have been behind me right but the reason why i don't uh, why i don't do that is because i believe that it's a phony sense of security i don't like the idea that people get misled and i'm afraid they get misled when it comes to this because if there's a candidate out there that has a questionable group of donors or a couple of donors, they're not, if, if they don't want to disclose that, guess what? 
they don't file it onto their books or, or make it public until the day after the election. And so I think people get a false sense of security saying that they know because of this exactly who's funding a campaign. And that's, that's not right. So I, I think that the, the laws that have been put together in the LAA, the Local Authorities Elections Act, and I was involved in the re, rewrite of that uh, extensively over the last two years, I believe that the rules that are in there are there for a reason, and I think they work good. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and the last question of this first round of questioning is, uh, with a vacancy rate approaching 0% in the city of Calgary, what long-term action will you take to ensure young professionals and students have a place to live here in Calgary? That, that's a very good question. We have a, we have a situation here, there's no question about it. I think one of the, um, the things that should be done is changing the rules for the secondary suites. One of the things that keeps a person from bringing a legal, illegal suite to legal is the costs that are involved. One of the rules that are there by the province is that you have to have two furnaces. Why in the world do you need two furnaces? I mean, there's all, there's all kinds of ways of making sure that a person has a roof over their head and they're warm without making sure, without saying to the owner, you have to spend the money to put in a separate set of ductwork and that. Another one in there is that it can't be over 700 square feet. There's a lot of uh, secondary suites that just don't work at, at 700 square feet. Maybe it should be 800 or 900, but those are things that should be relaxed. The windows, of course, I would not uh, say that there's any relaxation there. We, the, they have to build the, the proper size windows so people are, are safe to get out of there. But that would be a way that we could do something about it to change, those, change the bylaw on that. But I also think that a lot of it is education. A lot of the people that have secondary suites, they don't even want to tell anybody they got the secondary suite. If there's a way that we could get to get the education out to them there to say that it's not that difficult to take it from an illegal state to a legal state and we'll help them. Look, last year we put out a, not last year, two years ago, I guess, we put out a program where we offered people $25,000 to convert their illegal suites to legal. It, uh, and we had 50. We said we're going to have 50 of these, right? It was like pulling teeth to try and find 50 people in the city of Calgary that wanted $25,000 to convert it. So I really think a big problem is the education. You know? There should be a way to do that. All right, thank you very much, Alderman Stevenson. Um, we're now about halfway through our evening's program, and uh, so we're going to take a short 15-minute break. Uh, just a reminder uh, that during the break, uh, please submit any ward-specific questions you might have to Lisa out there at the back by the door. Uh, please write your question on the card you were provided or get a card uh, at the table in the center of the room. Uh, we're going to ask everyone to be back in your seat before the 15-minute break is up so we can end on time this evening. Uh, thank you very much to Alderman Stevenson so far, and we'll see everybody in 15 minutes. Uh, we have one more round of questions as submitted online by citizens across Calgary. Uh, so as a reminder, we're going to go through a series now of four questions that were submitted online. Uh, and Alderman Jim Stevenson, who's joining me this evening, uh, will have uh, two minutes to answer those questions. If he'd like to expand on his answer a little bit, he can cash in one of the poker chips that he's holding on to so diligently thus you want far. Want to get another evening. four for this time, too? <laughs> you don't need eight chips for four okay. questions, sir. Let's not get greedy. <laughs> All right. So the first question is, uh, what is your stance on social housing? Uh, how do you think the city uh, should support the development of social housing? I think we're, we're doing a, is, am I on? Testing? Yeah, I'm on? Okay. Okay. Um, I think that actually the city is doing a good job of, um, in the social housing area. We've, um, we've not only got our Calgary Housing Corporation, but we're also doing, um, uh, a, a number of different uh, assisted living t type of uh, programs, right? The affordable housing and these programs are, are great because they help people get into the um, um, position where they actually own some property of their own. I mean, I know that we can provide low-income housing where people rent, uh, but 
I think getting people into the position where they can own their own home is a great thing, and that that program um, is it's being headed up by David Watson, uh, and we just opened um, a, um, a part of a complex up in Skyview Ranch just a couple of months ago, and these people are quite often it's a, a single mother with uh, a child or two children that is working, but she can't uh, get into um, a home without some assistance of her own, a home of her own. And so we provide that uh, seed money for her to get in. And then when she sells the home, that gets paid back into the, into the system, right? So it's, I think we've got a very good system going, even though, going back to my statement from before, this is a provincial territory that we're in, but still we're doing a number of things to help our, our Calgary citizens out. You know? All right, thank you very much. Uh, next question is a short one. Uh, do you support a City of Calgary living wage policy? No, I do not. And this is a controversial thing for, for me. I've been in a lot of deba debates about this, but I honestly believe, and I might have to use a chip here because I get on a rant about this. <laughs> I honestly believe that the living wage is something that hurts the very people we want to help. And uh, the reason is because it, it, to me, it cuts off the lower steps of the economic staircase. If we were to, as they were urging back a couple of years ago, um, put a 1350 um, living wage into place, what that means if someone is only able to bring to the marketplace $10 worth of value per hour, they're unemployed, unemployable. We can't, you can't ask a, um, an employer to pay someone thirteen fifty if they're only able to deliver $10 worth to the marketplace, right? The other side of it is if you say that, okay, this is the, where everybody starts is thirteen fifty, then everybody else has to move up. The fact is that nobody can live, or I don't know who can live on thirteen fifty an hour. It would be very difficult to do that, right? Uh, so what we're trying to do is cause people to increase their value so that they can actually earn a living wage. I know they call it a living wage, but that's not what a person needs to live on, right? So I have to give you my own example. When I was uh, 17 years old, I had to quit high school because my parents, my father had died, my mom couldn't afford to keep me in school. So I went out to look for a job with a grade 10 education. I was offered two jobs. One was uh, a laborer at $1.75 an hour. The other one was an apprenticeship at $1.26 an hour. The reason I took the $1.26 an hour one was because I believed that that was a chance for me to get on a staircase and move up. Tell me when I'm going to throw my chip in here. <laughs> so the thing is, I did that because I believed that I would be able to grow in the, in the position where at the, as a laborer I wouldn't be able to grow into, into a higher income. So instead of trying to um, give people a forced amount at that thirteen fifty an hour, what we need to do is teach them the very basics of what they can do to create more worth in the marketplace so that they can climb up that economic staircase and be able to earn really what is a living wage. And that's, that's not possible by just saying that's the way it is. I know of some people that have a son that is, works as a dishwasher. He lives at home. He has some challenges, but he works as a dishwasher for $10 an hour. And if we were to say that he had to be paid $13.50 an hour, he, would, he wouldn't have the job. He'd be at home, sitting at home instead, right? So he's able to deliver $10 worth of value, and he has a job there. But he's not somebody that's expecting to have to live on that wage because of the fact that his parents can keep him living. So, so it's, I, that's a long-winded answer, but I, I feel very strongly about that one. Oh, thank you very much for the answer. Uh, the next question is, um, do you believe that Calgary requires a city charter? Uh, what powers does the city need that it does not currently have? Okay, I sit on, um, I'm a vice president of the AUMA, which is the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association, right? And one of the things that we do as the AUMA is lobby the provincial government to um, come up with better funding structures, better um, 
um, programs to help support the municipals, the municipalities in this province. A part of that is what we call an MGA. The MGA, the Municipal Government Act, in fact, I was in Edmonton, the meeting didn't get finished till three o'clock this afternoon, where we're actually discussing how we amend the MGA, the Municipal Government Act. The charters is something that is a, a way of the two big cities having a chance to uh, negotiate an agreement with the province outside of the MGA. Well, when I say that, we're not sure whether it'll be a separate section in the MGA or a separate uh, thing outside of the MGA, but it would be specifically to deal with the two large cities and the individual problems that those two cities have got. I'm totally in agreement with that. I would hope that we can do something for all the municipalities in the in the province through this MGA review, but a part of it is the uh, the charter. And I, um, Mandel, the the mayor of Edmonton, and myself a year ago June, we signed the MOU with the minister, the um, uh, memorandum of understanding to get this whole thing started. So I was I'm definitely in favor, of it and I think that there's a lot of work to be done but it's something that we can achieve for to get a better deal for the city of Calgary and the city of Edmonton. Thank you very much. Uh, the final question of this round uh, of the uh, crowdsourced questions from the internet. Um, if elected, how will you uh, help council repair flood damaged public infrastructure and strengthen Calgary's flood mitigation policies and infrastructure? Well, as, as you know, we had a, a serious, <coughs> excuse me, we had a serious flood here in 2005, uh, and that flood was supposed to be the one in a hundred year flood. We did a lot of mitigation, spent a lot of millions of dollars on mitigation, and if in fact this flood that we had in 2013 was the same as 2005, we wouldn't have had any damage in the city. So we did a good job of, of preparing for, for that type of flood. There was no way that we could have been prepared for the kind of flood that we had. It was at least three and a half times as much water as what we had had in 05. There are a lot of things that can be done to uh, mitigate it. We have to work with the province on it. Some of the things can be done locally, but one of the things that has to be done, and we have to have the provincial involvement in this, is we have to get a better control of the flow of the bowl. Got that? <laughs> we need to control the flow of the bowl better than what we're doing. And that means the upstream dams have got to be uh, looked at to see whether or not there's a way of improving the capacity of those dams to hold back water when we need to hold it back. We on the Calgary Regional Partnership, we're, that's the another area we haven't talked about yet that is extremely important, but for this whole Calgary metropolitan area, we're trying to come up with a development plan for all of the, the area. One of the things we've been looking at there is how we uh, create the storage of water to be able to deal with a population two and three times the population we've got right now. So we've already been talking about ways of, of controlling the flow of the bowl, uh, but we, it could be a two-sided thing. It could be not only to store the need, water that we need for the future development of the whole region, but it could also be to control the amount of water coming through, in fact, lower those dams um, before a uh, flood, before there's a lot of flood water coming, and then uh, allowing that water to build up in there. Therefore, we can control the amount coming through the city at any one time. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so that brings uh, an end to the second round of questioning and uh, brings us on to my favorite part of the evening. Uh, we call this the how round, and I'm going to explain very quickly how this works uh, so the alderman can grab himself a drink of water here. Uh, so it's a quick round of questions. Uh, I'm going to ask three. Uh, you can put your coins away because you cannot use them uh, in this round, uh, but you can't go home with them. <laughs> Sometimes it's difficult providing specifics in a small brochure or on a website that you want to ensure is not too wordy. Uh, this is your chance to provide details. That's why we call it the how round. I visited your website and read uh, your brochures and some of your uh, literature and press clippings and picked three of your top priorities or issues that you've dealt with over the last little while. For each, you'll be given 30 seconds to tell us exactly how you plan to accomplish the stated goal. 
Uh, please be as specific as possible and avoid giving any background as to why the goal is important. This is the time for details. The first question is, on your website, you said you look forward to raising the profile of Calgary as a city that understands the value of its distinct quarters and the diversity within them. In 30 seconds, how do you plan to do that? I think we're already, I think we're already doing it, but um, one of the things that has to be, um, we have to continually work on is what I call integration of the various cultures that we have here in the city. And I think we're doing um, all right but we've got to do a lot better job of getting the various uh, ethnic backgrounds. And we've got a number of groups, especially in my ward here, of, uh, from uh, the uh, East Indian community, the Filipino community, the Chinese community. We've got to better, do a better job of integrating those people into the, the mainstream here. So, All right. Thank I you very much. I have a lot much. more to say on that. Many. <laughs> 30 seconds just flies by. Uh, second question. In a Calgary Herald profile of you, you said, we must maintain essential services as we continue to grow at an unprecedented rate. In 30 seconds, how will you do that? Well, one of our problems, a big problem, is the financing. Uh, we, out of every tax dollar that uh, is paid by the people in the city of Calgary, because there's a lot more than municipal taxes, out of every tax dollar, 10 cents goes to the municipality, 29 cents go to the province, goes to the province, and 61 cents goes to the feds. Our biggest challenge is being able to get enough of that money back to deal with the areas that we need to deal with to provide those essential services. That's one of the reasons why I'm on the AUMA, to lobby a better, more sustainable, sustainable a predictable source of funding. Great. Thank you very much. And the third question of the how round, third and final. In various media outlets this past January, you suggested the city has to do a better job of identifying school zones and playground zones. How can this be done? You have 30 seconds. We, just were, we were just in an, a, a, quite a heavy discussion about that this afternoon at this meeting, determining what we need to change on the MGA, because we got to the point about reserve land. We have to put together reserve land in every new municipality that's developed. How we actually break that down is, uh, is still a bit of a puzzle to me, but we're presently not doing a very good job of allowing enough land for the schools in order to give, make sure there's parking on site, to make sure that there's room for pullouts, pull out, or laybys for the buses and the cars and so on. We're presently not doing good at that. All right, thank you very much. So that wraps up the how round, and now we're going to move on to the round uh, of the evening, where we actually ask questions that were sourced right from people here in the uh, in the building this evening. So uh, you're going to have again two minutes to uh, to answer each of these four questions, and uh, if you would like to expand on your answer a little bit, you do have the option of cashing in your chips as well. So these questions were, uh, were submitted with the idea that they would be specifically applicable to Ward 3, but uh, they may be applicable to other wards as well. Vibrant communities depend upon ordinary people being out on the street, walking, shopping, eating, and lingering. How will you make Ward 3's communities more vibrant and people-friendly? One of the things that we have been doing is in the new communities that are being built, we're we're uh, trying to create more walkable communities. <clears throat> I don't want to be here to promote any one community, but there is a new community being built in the Northeast that is um, quite different than what we've ever built before, where the, the um, uh, houses are built, the, the um, verandas, porches are quite close to the streets, so it's a walkable community with um, uh, row houses on it and houses a lot higher density than what we're normally uh, used to. There is no decrease in the width of the street. The street is actually about six inches wider than what it normally is, but it looks closer because of the fact that the, uh, the houses are closer to the sidewalk, right? We accomplished that by, it took some work, but we got the, um, uh, the ATCOs and the uh, NMAXs and so on to agree to put their servicing rather than underneath the front lawn under the street. Right now, in pretty well all the houses in the, in the city, the servicing is underneath your front lawn, close to the street. 
but we moved the servicing out under the, the street itself, and that allowed a shortening of that front lawn. What it did was it made it easier for people to get into a house because the cost is quite a bit lower by doing that, but it also, I believe, is going to be a walkable, friendly community where people are going to have their faces onto the street and there'll be more talking to neighbors and so on, right? So that's just one area where I think we're making progress. There's a lot of things that can be done with designing new communities to make sure that there is um, shopping within walking distance from where they live, and that would allow people to, to go for a stroll with their kids and pick up their groceries rather than having to jump in their car, right? So those are all things we're working on. Unfortunately, the communities that we've got right now, we can't change those, but we're, we're working on new ones to make them better. Thank you very much. Uh, the second question uh, solicited from the audience here tonight is, uh, do you support the creation of safe, separated bike infrastructure to allow Ward 3 residents to ride bicycles on uh, city roads? I support it in certain cases. Um, I don't know of any place in Ward 3 <clears throat> where we've had any, we've even had uh, uh, consideration. The, uh, the ones that have come forth are ones in the downtown, and um, um, I didn't support the 14th Street uh, one, but uh, the reason was because we didn't get a chance to. We didn't know it was happening until it was already there. Well, I think it was 14th Street, wasn't it, that there was the controversy about? Anyway, uh, but I don't know that in Ward 3 we have any uh, situations there where a, a separate dedicated lane would be uh, warranted or be necessary or even requested. If, they, if there was, we'd, we'd look at it for sure. All right, thank you very much. Uh, the third question, uh, can you name one bylaw or motion that you were particularly disappointed to see voted down by council in the past three years? Um, I guess the, the biggest one, um, I, I totally disagreed with the reclassification of Métis Trail. Um, there were people on council that wanted to downgrade it from an um, expressway to a major, and I fought that. I had to fight it back in the last council. I won it then, but that was at the same time that I was fighting the downgrading of Métis Trail and, the, and, and putting the tunnel in and all the rest of it. I won it all in that uh, battle, but I didn't win it this time. So they downgrade, downgraded Métis Trail uh, to a major, it actually makes my life a lot easier right now, the fact that it's downgraded, because in the development of all the areas along there, it makes more access available to Métis Trail because it's not an expressway. I just think it was the long, wrong decision long term. I think that we, we should have been looking at 20, 30 years from now and the, uh, the fact that we'll need that north-south um, um, grade-separated uh, road to get the the trucks around the airport out of the city and into the city and so on. And I think we were short-sighted on that. But of course, that's one of the things that I keep harping on is the city has a reputation of reacting to growth rather than planning for growth. And that was an, another example, as was the airport tunnel, was an example where we could have planned for growth. You know. All right, thank you very much. And the, the final of the four questions from the audience tonight, uh, this touches on a subject that we discussed earlier. Uh, the next council will have to negotiate a new development agreement with residential land development companies. Would you vote to eliminate development subsidies? If yes, why? If no, where would you raise the funds to cover the costs of those subsidies? Where, uh, I guess I have to ask you about these subsidies, or I don't know what subsidies we're talking about here. What would we be eliminating? Um, what do they mean by the, that? The, you know? the, the question refers to the uh, residential land development uh, companies and <clears throat> the, the agreement with them in terms of uh, development. Well, I, I guess they're likely talking about um, the uh, levies, the um, acreage assessment that we have, right? The acreage assessments, all new developments pay an acreage assessment into a fund, right? And that fund is used for development of the, of the not only the area, but the whole uh, the bigger area of that part of the city, but also for the other parts of the city too. I think we've got a very good system in place right now. We basically doubled those uh, acreage assessments two years ago, 
And so I'm, I don't, at the present time, see a need for us to increase those acreage assessments. I think that it's going to work very well what we've done with that. Okay, thank you very much. So that wraps up our, uh, our questions this evening. Uh, I'd like to provide uh, Alderman Jim Stevenson one minute to, uh, to close out the evening. Well, I, I think that it's, um, I, I think I'm a, a very blessed man to have the, the job that I've got, right? I just um, enjoy what I do, and I'm very blessed also to have the support of my wife. She's here in the back row, and Diane's been very supportive of me all through the, um, the three times that I've run. Now I'm on the fourth time, because if you don't know, I ran in 2004. I didn't win, I lost by 180 votes, but I beat Nancy. <laughs> he, he was number four coming in, or, or four or five, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, the, I think that I've got the job that I enjoy doing, and I really look forward every day to going to work, and I look forward to the input from the people, right? So I'm asking, I'm, I'm presently an alderman, but I'm asking for your permission to be a counselor, right? And that's what I'm asking for is your support to allow me to take this four-year term to do what I can for this community because I believe in the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alderman Jim Stevenson. Uh, thank you uh, again and all the best on Election Day. Uh, a big thank you to Civic Camp and the citizens who provided the questions this evening. Uh, also like to thank all of our sponsors, CBC Calgary, uh, CJSW, Fast Forward Weekly, Metro Calgary, LivestreamCalgary.com, Calgary Sound Rentals, uh, Calgary Roadrunners, Calgary Association of Parents and School Councils, the Alberta Teachers Association, the Students, Asso Students Association of Mount Royal University, the University of Calgary Students Union, the Calgary Foundation and our host tonight, Harvest Hills Alliance Church, for their generous donations. Again, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight to learn a little bit more about your candidate. Uh, remember, Civic Camp is also hosting trustee, mayoral, and counselor forums that you are eligible to vote in, so please visit civiccamp.org for dates and details. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much for coming and for tuning in. <laughs>